Today's lecture will take a look at research methods that are used in health psychology, focusing primarily on research design issues. There are lots of different kinds of questions we try to address with research in health psychology. Lots of questions, different contexts, different populations, and this requires lots of different kinds of research. There is no one design that can be used to study all kinds of questions that might be of interest in health psychology. Uh, some questions might be, for example, uh, is a variable associated with some health outcome among a certain population? That might require a certain kind of design. We may be interested in whether some sort of treatment has some effect on some illness, behavior, or other kind of outcome. Or we might be interested in some individual difference variables, things like what role do genetics or personality uh, play in illness and behavior. Each of these might require a different type of design to ideally study that question. No matter what the design, all research methods share some common characteristics. One of those is we have an ideal of objectivity. What that means is in all scientific studies we are striving uh, to be as objective observers of phenomena as possible. We acknowledge that that is an ideal that is likely never fully achieved. Uh, we are always striving for more and more objectivity, but there really is no pure objectivity in science. Even the simple selection of the questions and variables that one might study um, are contrary to the ideal of objectivity. Um, and so it's something we strive for, but we, we perhaps never quite reach it. Uh, all research methods rely upon measurement, good measurement, and by good measurement what we usually mean is reliable and valid measurement. Uh, the lecture to follow this one will focus on measurement and touch on these points in a lot more detail. Uh, the last thing we expect in all research approaches is that they require replication and peer review. Any one study is never enough to fully answer any question or to have us uh, have a certain conclusion about any kind of research question. Uh, science requires replication, so can we have the same findings if we do the study again or different people do the same or very similar study? And we also require peer review, so research is subject to presentation or publication in a peer review context where uh, expert peers will review that work for quality, for appropriateness, for thoroughness, and will uh, make determinations about whether uh, studies are of sufficient quality and importance to, to be added to our research literature. Uh, each of those points is an important kind of safeguard to make sure that we are uh, trying to uh, derive appropriate answers from research methods and not misusing uh, research to uh, forward other goals. The main hallmark for most research methods is the experimental method. The experimental method involves controlled studies in which the researcher manipulates variables and attempts to control for other factors. Uh, in experimental research designs, you're trying to isolate a, the inference you can gain from the research question and trying to eliminate as many other possible explanations. Typically we do that by trying to control for other factors or variables that may influence the question. This is most often accomplished via random assignment or what we call randomization um, of the unit of study. Most often, and certainly in the types of studies we do here in the Department of Psychology at OSU, this involves randomization of people. So individuals in study may be randomized to different conditions, to different experiences within the study, and then we look at the um, that effect that has on the dependent variables, and that gives us inference about the, um, the aspect on which the randomization happened. Sometimes in health psychology, the unit of study is not participants, but it might be classrooms or schools, large groups of pre-existing folks. It might be communities. Um, in some studies in health psychology, people identify um, communities that may be similar in size, in demographic makeup, um, or other kinds of variables. And they may randomize the level of community. For example, if they're trying to examine the effect of some new policy or a new health promotion program on the behavior of a population in the community, they may actually randomize the community as a whole, um, randomly select which community gets the intervention versus one that doesn't, and that helps us understand um, and gain inference about the impact of that intervention on the community as a whole. Typically in experimental methods, the manipulated variable, the one that we, we 
uh, change people's experience of, participants' experience. This might be a treatment or, a, or the absence of a treatment. Uh, that variable is called the independent variable, or IV. Measured variables that are thought to be affected by the independent variable are what we call the dependent variables, or DVs. In health psychology, common DVs are things like health outcomes, like the presence or absence of a disease state, like heart disease or diabetes. Um, it might be health behaviors, uh, like, like individuals' uh, consumption of fruits and vegetables, or perhaps physical activity. It might be the costs of health care or the costs upon the economy of a certain uh, variable. Uh, these are common dependent variables that we see in experimental studies in health psychology. There's a number of examples of experimental methods, uh, certainly laboratory-based experiments, uh, the type that you might even participate in your SONA research participation, are typically good examples of the experimental method. One of the challenges to purely laboratory-based experiments is the struggle between what's called internal validity versus external validity. Internal validity really refers to aspects of a research design that improve the objectivity of the study and control for many, many variables. But to the extent that we do that, we often are making the laboratory experience less and less like the real world, and that reduces external validity. External validity really refers to how does this uh, research relate to what really happens in the real world. And typically, in general, to the extent that a study maximizes internal validity, that is usually at the sacrifice of external validity. So often we need studies that have both high external validities, validities, validity, though they may be uh, noisy and may have lots of variables uncontrolled, those are important. We also need those highly controlled laboratory experiments with high internal validity. In combination, those two kinds of studies typically give us uh, the highest confidence answers. There are also treatment or intervention outcome studies that are called randomized controlled trials, or RCTs. These are experiments typically done in the real world with um, uh, real world participants that evaluates the efficacy of a treatment, perhaps a medicine, maybe a uh, cognitive behavioral treatment program, or a health promotion intervention uh, for a community or uh, a small group, for example, a school system. And we would randomize participants to either receive or not receive that treatment, and then we would evaluate the impact over time of the outcomes of that intervention. If there was a difference between receiving the intervention or not receiving it, then we might have inference that there is some efficacy to that particular uh, treatment or intervention approach. One of the things that's become importantly, increasingly important in recent years is standardizing how people go about reporting randomized clinical trials in the research literature. There's a number of good reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that we want to improve accountability to the public. So we want the public to be able to understand research, understand the outcomes of that research. Of course, much of that research is funded by taxpayers, and it's reasonable to expect that taxpayers should be able to um, be consumers of the information that comes out of that research. And it will be helpful if the research is reported in a standardized way that people can recognize and come to um, understand, even if they're non-experts in the area. Another really good reason is that there is so much research these days that we really need um, efforts to summarize or combine the results of research. We'll talk about meta-analysis in a few slides, but that's one way we go about that. Well, that effort to, to summarize or combine the results from several independent studies becomes much easier if studies report similar information in a similar way. Uh, in the mid-1990s, journal editors really led the the charge on this and recognize that there was a lot of inconsistency in the way people reported the results of their research and they needed some standards. And so they came together with this um, uh, product called the CONSORT Guidelines. The CONSORT Guidelines. I forget right now what that acronym stands for, but it's an acronym uh, for something. And it's designed to provide a, um, a template or guidelines of what information needs to be included in reports of randomized trials. It includes how, for example, people talk about the participants who are in their study, which is an important part of determining how well the studies generalize to other populations of interest. Uh, 
Uh, research journals today voluntarily agree to adhere to that consort guidelines uh, for the reports of RCTs. And what we've seen since the release of RCTs is much more consistency. The goal has been achieved. Uh, much more consistency in the reporting of randomized trials and literature and makes it much easier to, um, uh, again, combine results from different studies. This is an example of one of the guidelines from CONSORT, which is to provide what's called a participant flow diagram. This helps the reader understand who was in the study, um, how were they recruited in the study, who was excluded and why. Uh, this is actually a flow diagram from a study completed in my lab of an intervention for HIV adherence that was completed in a clinic setting uh, with uh, patients living with HIV. And as you can see here, we initially approached 441 patients. We excluded most of those for a number of reasons. Some declined to participate. Another group uh, did not meet the inclusion criteria, which would be described elsewhere in the paper. We ended up with about 100 folks that were randomized to either get the intervention or not. Uh, TAU is a common acronym you'll see that refers to treatment as usual. And then you'll see that uh, most folks who were randomized did receive the intervention, but some were lost at that point because they withdrew or uh, perhaps died or some other adverse event. And then you can see how many participated in the follow-up and why some of those people may have not participated. Uh, our most common reason in our study was that we lost contact with them. Either a phone was disconnected, uh, mailing addresses were returned without forwards, etc. So you can see that this kind of diagram uh, really helps people understand who was in the study and whose data was included in the final outcomes that were analyzed. Another type of research design frequently used are correlational studies, or what are sometimes called observational studies. The goal of this research is usually to examine the association between two or more variables. Correlation is usually the statistic that is used to measure uh, co um, in correlational studies. Correlation is a measure of covariance, or the strength of association. How much does one variable change in relation to changes in the other variable? The correlation statistic score ranges from positive 1.0 to negative 1.0 with uh, larger numbers indicating a stronger association. Positive correlations mean that higher scores on one variable are associated with higher scores on the other. For example, we might uh, find that physical activity and fruit and vegetable consumption are positively correlated, meaning that people who are more active also eat more fruits and vegetables, people who are less active eat less fruits and vegetables, that would be an example of a positive correlation. Negative correlations are somewhat the opposite. Higher scores on one variable are associated with lower scores on the other. For example, we may find that physical activity is negatively correlate, correlated with, uh, consumption, uh, with fat consumption in the diet. So we might find that people who are more active consume less fat in their diet, and people who are less active consume more fat as one goes up, the other goes down. That's a negative correlation. One important point is that correlation does not imply causation, and we get this confused frequently. You see this confused all the time in the media. There's a number of reasons for this. Uh, one is there's a chicken versus the egg problem. We simply don't know which comes first. Um, we don't know, for example, in the example I just used, whether people who are more active also therefore want to eat a better diet so they eat less fat and more fruits and vegetables, or is it that eating more fruits and vegetables and less fat gives people more energy to be more active? Who knows? It's chicken versus the egg in a purely correlational study. There's also always the problem of a third variable problem. It may be that the two, uh, the two variables are unrelated themselves, but that they are correlated because they are both themselves associated with a third variable. For example, if we see that physical activity and uh, fruits and vegetable consumption are positively correlated, it may be that there's some third variable, like for example, a personality characteristic that tends to predict both of those. And so the two of them being correlated together are sort of um, an anomaly that's really about that third variable. There are also quasi-experimental methods these types of methods are usually interested in similar questions as experiments, but they're done when random assignment is difficult or impossible. For example, any study that compares gender, um, how men or women may differ on something, is always going to be quasi-experimental because, of course, we cannot randomly assign people to gender. They come as they are. 
Uh, a similar example is perhaps exposure to events. We might want to know the impact of a traumatic experience, uh, like 9-11, for an example. Well, we can't randomize people to experience 9-11 or not. Uh, they did or they didn't. And um, that then might be used to look at the outcome. So again, uh, similar to correlational studies, we cannot infer causation here, but can sometimes look at some really interesting hypotheses, and this may be the only way to do this. Two different types of quasi-experiment methods are retrospective. These are studies that often look at historical factors, may go back and look at uh, historical data to try to determine are things associated. Prospective studies try to look forward in time to see whether or not um, different variables might influence uh, factors or outcomes. Looking at exposure to a traumatic event like 9-11 might be an example uh, where we might look at from the time of that experience, which happened when it happened, and moving forward in time, what impact does that have on, for example, health outcomes uh, would be one example. We may also see developmental approaches, or what we call longitudinal studies. Uh, these may be interested in how factors influence health over time or over a lifespan. Two different approaches to this are cross-sectional versus longitudinal. Cross-sectional design on the lower part of the, the figure on the right-hand part of the slide pick people at different time age points or developmental stages at this particular point in time and look at differences. So we may look at elementary school kids, compared to college-aged young adults, compared to middle-aged adults right now at one time. That's called a cross-sectional design. Ideally, longitudinal designs are preferable because they have many advantages. That's where we would take people who perhaps are elementary school age now, and we follow that same group of people across time into young adulthood, into middle age, they have many advantages because they rule out many of the limitations of a cross-sectional design, which, as you can imagine, if we take a cross-sectional design of elementary kids, college young adults, and middle-aged adults, well, they're not just different in terms of developmental stage. There are many, many differences there, including uh, the experiences they've had up to that point in their life, the era in which they grew up. Uh, college young adults today are very different than middle-aged adults were even when they were in college because of the presence of social media, the internet, all kinds of other variables. So there's all kinds of limitations. Longitudinal designs often give us the best answer about developmental questions. There are, of course, limitations. Uh, uh, you lose participants over time. It's very hard to keep track of people over a long period of time, particularly lifetimes. And it can take a long time to get answers. If you're interested in how things develop from uh, childhood um, uh, through later life, uh, you're going to have to wait a few generations to get those answers, whereas we can often get answers more quickly with a cross-sectional design. The last type of design I'll mention are meta-analyses and systematic reviews. I mentioned earlier how much uh, the volume of science we have today and how important it is to have reliable reviews or summaries of all of that research. These are what are referred to as secondary reviews of the literature, and they are growing in importance. The literature is simply growing too fast to keep up, uh, and policymakers, um, practitioners, healthcare providers really need expert summaries to inform decisions. There are two types of these that are important. One is a meta-analysis. Meta-analyses are what we call a study of studies. They're an empirical review where the studies that have been done and reported are actually the subject of interest. Meta-analyses often generate what are called effect sizes, which help us estimate the size or impact of an effect, whether it be very small or whether it be large. Systematic reviews are another type of review. These can use meta-analytic methods, but they may also not. They may use more uh, qualitative review methods. And what systematic reviews are are rigorous forms of reviewing the evidence and drawing conclusions. They typically have very strict rules to follow and protocols, much like you would see in an experimental method. And they, they try to uh, eliminate bias and maximize objectivity uh, by using those kinds of rigorous systematic methods to draw their conclusions. So that provides an overview of uh, experimental methods and research design uh, issues related to health psychology.